I'm Bob Murray. I'm the provost of, of St. Thomas Aquinas College. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here. Today I just have a few opening comments and then I'm going to hand it over to the director of Hudson Link, uh, Sean Pika. Um, and then there are other people Sharon's going to speak. So we have a couple of people who are going to tell you about the work here. Um, the, uh, it doesn't seem that long ago that um, uh, Barbara Yance, who's retired from here but was an art professor for many years, uh, and uh, um, Ellen brought this to me, uh, this idea to me, um, and, and a committee of other faculty members brought this to me, and uh, it just happened very quickly. Uh, it came together very quickly thanks to the work of a lot of people in this room, especially Dr. Stacy Sewell and Mary Donnelly. Where is Mary? Mary hiding behind a pillar. Uh, <laughs> So thanks to them, let's give them a round of applause because of so much work goes on behind the scenes to get these classes scheduled and to get all the details worked out. It's a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and so I really thank them uh, for this. And of course, I also thank it, especially tonight, Sharon Lindenfeld. Sharon had the wonderful idea to teach drawing at our uh, newest campus in Sullivan Correctional and uh, had to even really better idea to work with Stacy to put this up uh, for us to see. So it's just, it's remarkable to see this work and to see that, to hear the stories of the faculty who work here, who teach up there, and how transforming it is for them to work uh, up there at the, at the, at the, at Sullivan. And it's, um, it's just a, an amazing representation of our mission. There's probably no clearer manifestation of the college's mission than that program. I'm very proud uh, to have been a part of putting it together. So let's now introduce Sean Pika, who is the director of Hudson Link. Hudson Link is this terrific, really just amazing, oh, keep going. non-profit <laughs> organization uh, that really puts this stuff together for education, uh, for setting up campuses and, and teaching courses in prisons in the state of New York. So Thank you. It, thanks. It's a, perfect, it's a perfect arrangement. The college does all the work and we get all the credit. I, I, I love the way, the, the way it goes. <laughs> Uh, we are literally just a small nonprofit that goes between amazing students, fantastic colleges, and the Department of Corrections that don't know anything about how a college would actually operate. Anyone that's been in college, that works in a college, that works around a college knows it's a tricky uh, balance of a lot of different pieces. Doing that in a maximum security prison is just a whole new definition of tricky, right? So um, having professors that deliver the same exact coursework, um, textbooks, the professors, uh, the test, everything's identical to what you're seeing here on this campus to a non-traditional campus. And to have a, a, a professor um, come in and brave the artistic part of that is a, just a whole different component to it. Um, these men that are in a maximum security prison are the first in their families to go to college. They're doing this coursework and then in the midst of that, digging into parts of their lives that they didn't even know existed. A lot of what we do when we're in college, we don't see that as life skills, but this is not just about getting math. It's not just about doing English. It is not just about building your resume. Here, I hope not, right? I don't know. <laughs> For the students here right now, this is not just about building a resume. This is about what your, what your future looks like and how your life in the direction that it takes. It's the same thing for these students at this prison. We, we are, this is not our only site. We have nine different college partners. There are 644 of these students in five different prisons in New York. Um, let me just take a step back and say for my mom and dad that are retired New York City cops, this is not their favorite topic to talk about. <laughs> this is not everybody's favorite topic. Giving people second chances is not always what this work looks like. So I would just say for those of you in this room that don't understand why we're doing this work, just know one thing. 68% of the men and women in this country that go to prison return to prison in the first three years. That's an incredible statistic that plagues our communities. This work that we've done, we've just celebrated our 20th anniversary, less than 2% of our students in 20 years have gone back to prison. That is a value to our communities, to their families, and to our neighbors. Because if 95% of these students come back to the community, they're gonna live next door to us. How do we want them to return to our community, to be our neighbors, someone to participate, to be a positive force on our communities? That's what we want. 
And that's what we've been seeing. And we have our first graduation ever with this college at that campus coming up this, this summer. And I just want to thank Mary because you have done an amazing job of figuring out not just the course schedules, but the professor schedules and having all that meld to have a graduation really quickly um, with St. Thomas. So I just want to say thank you so much. And I will just finish by saying, I'm not just a director. I know that sounds so cheesy. When I was 16 years old, I made some super poor choices. And I was given a 24-year sentence. New York is one of only two states that, it, as a teenager, you're sentenced to a maximum security prison. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you think of it and said out loud. But when I entered that first prison, I was in the ninth grade. I was two inches shorter. I wasn't shaving yet. I didn't finish high school. And you know, if you think about that story, it should end horribly. But the fact is, the Department of Corrections and some of the men that I lived with, I was going to say they grabbed me. I came out all wrong. Uh, they really said, man, you haven't even finished high school. Have you thought about going back to school? And in the 80s, there was colleges in every single prison in New York. In 1994, they took all that away. They blamed it on funding, um, but the fact is, it was just not everybody's favorite thing. There were a lot of people that were against that work. I had 118 credits, no degree. And I thought, well, that's the end of my college experience. And then this program that I'm now the director of was formed, and I was able to finish my bachelor's degree. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It literally seems like yesterday that I was sitting in the largest cell block in the country thinking my life was over. And now today I'm the director of this program, not just changing the direction of my life, but about to change the direction of 25 more students' lives. This is something that is unfolded in a way that we could have never expected, but it took some colleges that were brave enough to tackle this as a project and to be involved. So I just say thank you so much, not just for these students, but for the work that you've done to support this and to see this amazing artwork up on the walls. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Stacy Sewell, and I just want to introduce Sharon Lindenfeld. Professor Lindenfeld is an adjunct professor of art at St. Thomas Aquinas College, and um, part of what we're trying to do at our college is to interest our faculty in making the considerable trip north to Sullivan Correctional Facility. Um, so um, Sharon has been willing to do that, and I think it's been really rewarding. And she'll speak more about her class and her experience. Okay. Hi, everyone. So last fall, I taught introductory drawing class at Sullivan. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the men I met there, and also about some of the differences between teaching here and teaching there. Um, first of all, supplies. Oh, it was the maximum security prison. Every time I went in, I had to get gate clearance, and sometimes things weren't um, allowed in. So I had to I have always a backup plan. So you had to be really creative and really resourceful in prison, and um, the guys were too. Um, another thing that was different is that here, usually when students take an art class, they're like really passionate about art, they've been doing it, even not an art major, they've always had an interest in it. But these guys, they kind of all take the same classes, and so a lot of them had never made art before, not since they were little kids. And it was a completely foreign sort of um, endeavor to look at the world around you and then interpret it and put it down onto a piece of paper. But over the course of the semester, they got better and better at it, and they got really into it. And um, others of them were already like outstanding artists who came in really talented, made beautiful work. Um, another thing about the students is they just approach their studies extremely philosophically. They see everything symbolically. Um, they, they care a lot about the work. Um, I would have them write essays. Um, like at the midterms and the finals, just talking about you know what they learned and what they needed to work on, and they would write these like really beautiful things about redemption and regret and perseverance. Um, so, one of um, my favorite stories from one of those essays uh, was about uh, some drawings the artist did of the killer clowns from outer space. They're not in this show. I chose other drawings from that student. But uh, he wrote in his essay about how, as a kid, his dad told him not to watch that movie because it would give him nightmares and keep him up all night. 
but then despite his dad, he watched them anyway. And then he was up all night. He was terrified, he heard a noise, and he couldn't fall asleep. So um, that's why he chose that imagery for his drawing because in the last paragraph he wrote that he now finds himself in a situation which he could have avoided if he had just taken some good advice. So to me that was a really powerful example of just how intertwined these men <coughs> approach their lives and their artwork and their schoolwork. Everything had, had this really, was really loaded with lots of meaning. So I'll, I want to talk to you a bit about some of the drawings. Um, they're organized Come on in. by subject. So over there, there's some animal drawings that they did. These ones are um, linear perspective drawings of the prison itself. So some of them are of their cells. Uh, one, the one on the top left was uh, the library. Um, and so you get like this really this amazing view into what they're experiencing on day to day uh, level. And then the one on the bottom is um, about freedom, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, so this is, this is like the art about prison. This over here is portraits. And then over here there's some landscape and then nature. Um, and then over here, this stuff is uh, symbolic, kind of about prison life and or other types of topics. So here there's a turtle that's escaping from like a rainstorm. Like the umbrella is morphing into a turtle and is flying away, or swimming away, which is representing freedom. Um, this one has a clock and the artist told me it was about doing time. So again, they always have these like really um, symbolic ways of looking at what they're drawing. Um, this one's also about freedom. And then this one has like lots and lots of layers of meaning that two artists did together. And so there's like drugs and violence and um, an oil spill happening, so lots of different social ills. And another thing that they wanted to talk about was how the things that happen in like an urban setting, like a city, also happen in rural settings. So they're trying to connect people instead of dividing. So they had all these really um, powerful messages and they, they wrote little, in some mm -hmm. cases, so you could check out what they wrote about their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, yeah, they check out the blurbs that they wrote. And I also want to read um, this quote to you. And this is just in the artist's words from one of these essays. Um, when working on art, I am sharing an intimate relationship with self. The feeling is unexplainable because for me, it takes me far out into empty space where I'd be so engulfed into the artwork that when I come back from being in that zone, I am at peace with myself. And I just found that to be a very beautiful example of how art can be transformative in someone's life and if you give them momentarily uh, some reprieve, a chance to express their humanity and um, explore um, ideas. Can either does anybody have any questions? Any questions, okay. Dr. Shea? Question? Can yeah. you talk about a little bit about um, art materials that you mm -hmm. could bring into the prison and the limitations that you might have had? Sure. So um, Hudson Link got us a bunch of paper and charcoal. They were allowed to have that, and then some of the guys also ordered their own like pastels that they got themselves. Um, and I had like a kind of a, a standing. Um, gate clearance so I can bring in paper whenever I want, so I bring in sometimes different kinds of paper and there was no problem with that. Um, the biggest issue was more with th things to draw from. Like I wanted, I brought in like shells one day as you can tell, they're drawing shells. Um, I brought some sort of geometric shapes, but then certain other things like plastic forks were not allowed and so it was just like kind of you never really knew why certain things. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to point out, and we've talked about this in my classes over and over again, that what we've done over the past few decades really well, and I mean that in all the worst ways, we've marginalized people, we've taken people and deprived them of who they are and of their voice. And one thing that not only this program does, but specifically a class like this, is it's evidence of the voice. And I think you'll talk to people 
who have been in prison and who will say, and I'm sure you guys who know what I'm talking about, that we're judged by the worst thing we've ever done. And so I challenge my students, like, think about that. Like, think about the worst thing you've ever done and whether you'd want people thinking about that about you. So I think by looking at these, you see the best things. You see the best of their voice. And um, I think it gives you a window into the humanity of people. So just had to go there. So, uh, so Sharon um, has taught this course at Stack here on our campus and at Sullivan. Um, this semester, I'm teaching a course on the history of uh, the Vietnam War. I'm teaching it here, and I'm teaching it at Sullivan. And I just taught it last night here, and I told the students in my class, I'm teaching at Sullivan as well. And um, the question that I kind of wanted to throw out to all of you, to I, or to somebody, to kind of think about, um, that was not said in my classroom exactly, is, oh, um, how, how, much are, how much are they paying for that class, right? Um, you're all paying a lot for your classes. Um, how does, and maybe Sean, you're actually the best one to give us the best answer about this. Um, how do there we pay for this? There was a thought process 20 years ago when this was created um, that as students we had to give as well. Uh, it couldn't just be a supporter of the Department of Corrections. It couldn't just be a college that cared. Um, we couldn't just raise money that we were had to, to give it invest as well in our own futures. And the number that came up was $10 per semester. Now, before anyone throws anything at me, we were earning 18 cents an hour. And I was earning 18 cents as one of the highest paid because I was in the maintenance department. Some, some of the men were earning 10 to 12 cents an hour. So if you're earning 18 cents an hour, my paycheck at work was fifteen fifty every two weeks. So to give up every semester ten dollars was a huge investment and sacrifice. Um, in twenty years, ten years as a director, I've never heard a single man and woman in the program complain about that sacrifice. I have a question for you, Stace. Are your students reading? <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> Oh, the students um, in the facility are, are they do read <laughs> everything. Um, the students here, well, we, we have a little competition going on. I, I had to step in and do a, 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 one of the professors got sick and couldn't finish a class. So to not finish a class means that they lose a semester. So I stepped in, I, I have two graduate degrees. I stepped into a peer 101 class, peer counseling 101. And I didn't even have a book, so I got a copy of the book sent in the syllabus and said, hey, just read the first few chapters, I'll see you Tuesday. So I get there, two and a half hours into, into the class, I start running out of material, so I just did the last 10 minutes of just, you know, like, hey, do you have any questions for next week? And they're asking questions, I can't find, <coughs> so what chapter? That's chapter seven. They said, I haven't read past chapter three, what are you doing? But they're reading so far ahead in the book that I can't keep up with that. you one year incarcerated. And it's coming out of all of our pockets, right? Not directly, but go talk to your parents who pay taxes or me. Um, and so think about what we want to do with that money. Uh, two thirds coming back to prison in three years, or do we want people not coming back to prison and being productive members of society? I mean, that's a choice that we're making as a society. It's the choice we made in the 1990s. I say the royal we, because it was not me but the choice to not pay for prison programs, but we're paying for it anyway. So, I mean, keep that also in your mind when you think about something that is um, truly effective on so many different levels. Um, so. we, we have a, a special guest here. Um, <laughs> would you? Hi, for all of you all who don't know me, my name is Karen Wright. I'm the Vice President of Institutional Advancement. And um, I've been talking to two people who are from NYU, as you all know, we house the Silver School of Social Work, which has a, a strong interest in social justice and prison reentry. So we have Amenda, who runs the NYU program here on our Rockland campus. And as a guest, we have uh, Mr. Terrence Coffey, who is also a NYU adjunct and has a prison reentry story that if you has a wonderful story that if he doesn't mind sharing. He also is uh, works for the Doe Fund, and so he'll tell you a little bit about that. Terrence. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, 
I want to say that I, I, you know, I, I came in and I was looking, you know, walking around, looking at, looking at the artwork, and I was, I, I was moved. And I know you may think, what would you be moved? Uh, because outside of what uh, Ms. Wright has said, yes, I, I'm, a, I'm an adjunct professor here at New York University. Um, I earned my bachelor's and my undergraduate degree at New York University. I've studied in uh, Salzburg, Austria. Uh, I have a few articles that have been printed in uh, USA Today. I've done a few things, but my name is also Terrence Coffey, E604958. I'm also that person when she was just speaking about reading. I read probably two books in a day because literature is consumed. I look at the artwork and I and I see so many things because this picture here, uh, when I looked at it, it's a, a reflection of the world that we see in, in the environments of poverty and the conditions that we live in. So that's the way we see the world. So that's what the eye represents. And I, I kind of just was going through each one of these pictures and just kind of finding those moments that I found myself trying to do my own little artwork. And uh, like uh, the gentleman mentioned, uh, there was a time when they, they took all this out of the uh, institutions. Uh, I spent over 19 years of my life and various things and doing various things with this gun stuff. I, I lived that life, but one of the things that was said that, that, that was so true, uh, it, that you never seen, uh, have the opportunity to express your humanity. And if you deprive, deprive a person of the right to breathe, they'll gag for air. And gagging for air is not always a beautiful sight. But then sometimes it's, it's also reflective uh, in life. Uh, so I am very honored to be here. I'm, I'm very honored to see the work that's being done by St. Quintus and Stackett. Uh, this, this entire program, and I'm really interested in the, uh, the criminal justice course I heard uh, the, the young lady uh, speaking about. And I want to say to you, as I've said to my students last uh, semester, that I'm a firm believer that the future of this country and criminal justice reform and a host of other issues, social issues, really do lie in the hands of the the youth that, that the students that are in this room today. And I don't say that lightly. Some people may say it's like a, a cliche. I don't, I don't say that lightly because what I understand is that the uh, roles of leadership will fall to those who are prepared for, to deal with the, the, the realities of uh, society. So again, I, I'm just honored to be here. Um, um, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm looking forward to just having a chance to say hello to everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So take a look. Come read. Come take a look.